right, hi everybody. Um, so I'm Mike Elizabeth Scott. Um, I'm visiting here from San Francisco. And um, so something that's been really important to me in my life and has really been relevant in San Francisco lately has been this idea of um, creativity. And in San Francisco, you often see this as kind of a dichotomy between like tech and art. You know, the city has historically been this like thriving cultural center, you know, this epicenter of the LGBT rights movement. And now there's this huge tech bubble there and so much money pouring into tech. And it almost seems like these two things are kind of fighting. You have this technology on one hand and you have culture and technology or you have culture and art. And, and I don't think it has to be that way. You know, I think um, really technology is almost a distraction. You know, the word technology almost seems like the progression of time to me. It feels like um, technology is what happens when you're continuing to look for what the next thing is and try to continue to imagine what the world could be like. But um, when, you, when you kind of put that distraction aside, I think you really end up with topics that are more central to creativity. Topics um, like what does it really mean when you talk about art? What does it mean when you talk about engineering? And um, personally, my experience in this has kind of come to a peak in the last couple of years when I've really um, kind of really tried to switch from this extremely deep engineering oriented career to something that's much more focused on creativity and kind of forging human connections and, and really making art. And this has led me to LEDs. So, um, you know, here you see some LEDs. Um, I built these things. Um, these are uh, Fade Candy LED controllers. They're kind of a popular way of um, taking a whole bunch of, you know, digitally addressable lights and controlling them from processing or from whatever else you want to control them from. Um, but actually, I didn't make these particular ones. Adafruit makes these. Um, I made these by hand, um, you know, with a hot plate and tweezers in the basement. Um, and then, because of open source hardware, I was able to share that design um, with Adafruit, who manufactures them now. Um, and then, you know, it's not just Adafruit. I also have co uh, other collaborators manufacturing these designs now. Um, this is a version of the board made by RGB123. And just to give you an idea of what, um, what it looks like, you know, this is uh, 512 LEDs um, being controlled by one of those boards. So, you know, people use these for big and small art installations. And it's been a really interesting way lately to um, bring people together over, over workshops, over making art, over learning to solder. Um, and it's been a neat way of kind of showing people that technology can just be, you know, a tool. It can be, um, you know, kind of just a direction you go in. But, you know, the art can be much more central to what you're doing. The technology can be more of a detail. And so, you know, this has led to, um, you know, a lot of online tutorials. I've been giving classes. Um, and a lot of this has really been made possible by, um, you know, by open source. Um, so the way this really worked is, you know, I designed something that I needed myself for my own art project. Um, this happened around last summer. And then last fall, I spent some more time taking this thing that I made personally and expanding it, turning it into something that, um, you know, that I thought would be really widely applicable, something you could use with a lot of different kinds of um, embedded computers in a lot of different circumstances. And I put it out there on the internet, on GitHub. And then collaborators like Adafruit and RGB123, you know, take those designs and manufacture them. And so in return, I get a community and a little bit of money, but mostly, you know, people. And this becomes an ecosystem. And this, you know, this diagram right here is a lot of what you see about, um, you know, when you make open source hardware, when you, when you put a project out there, this is kind of what you expect. But, you know, really, it's a lot more complicated. You know, I'm, you know, and as, as a lot of people have mentioned, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, I use open source projects like, you know, GCC, the compiler suite. You know, this is based on the open pixel control protocol. You know, I use processing a lot. And the hardware itself is um, loosely based on the TNC 3.0 design, which is another um, embedded, um, you know, sort of Arduino-ish kind of ARM microcontroller device um, that's mostly open source. But then if you look inside the Teensy, you know, it's, it's actually one of these Freescale, um, you know, MK20DX128 chips. And it's like, well, you know, you can have a very open source design, but you keep going down and it has all of these things inside it. Um, and, you know, inside that, there's this ARM architecture. Um, and before you know it, it's this whole monster. And you don't have any idea how you could keep track of, you know, where everything comes from or where it's going. 
But, um, you know, when we talk about open source hardware or open hardware, you know, there's, there's usually kind of a few things that we care the most about. You know, if it's, if it's got an open support community, if, you know, the documentation is freely available, then that's, that's a really great start. Usually people want open source schematics, you know, open source um, firmware, software. So that's the level that we have with the Spade Candy controller. But there's so much more below that. There's, you know, the, the PC board fabrication relies on all of this process, you know, chemicals, industrial equipment that's not even remotely open. You can do it at home, but it's just, it's completely different. It would be like, you know, assembling these boards in my basement versus having them manufactured on professional machines. Then, of course, you know, the chips, the chips aren't open. You know, there, there are some groups that are working on open source processors, for example, but this is still so far from what we have in our day-to-day -day open source technology. And then there are things like the LEDs themselves, which is just so much of a, an issue of trying to make something very, very cheaply, which is not really something open source is always great at. So, you know, some of these problems are a lot more fun than others. You know, making a support community is, is great. You get to put people together. You get to make something that um, a lot of people can really rally around. And, you know, making an LED that's as cheap as possible is kind of boring. Um, but you can also think about this in terms of, you know, the, the support community and the software. Those things feel to me like art. Those are things that I expect to be able to put a lot of myself into, and I expect other people to be able to see that. You know, I expect it to start a communication. Whereas the engineering, you know, I, I don't know anything about the people who made the WS2811, and maybe I could, but it doesn't really give me incentive to. It's more of a commodity than something that I expect to be a communication. And another way to think of it is, you know, some people, you know, who use radios, for example, really need them to work well. And, you know, it doesn't really matter um, what goes on inside them. They just need them to be as reliable and as efficient as possible. Whereas some people, you know, might want to really tinker and experiment. And it becomes, you know, maybe even not a hobby. Maybe this is something that they can figure out how to kind of mesh into capitalism somehow. I think it's, um, it's an approach that's more about, you know, money versus, you know, free. But it's more about, you know, do you care more about the personal and interpersonal connections or just making the best thing you can make? And so you can kind of start to add words to, you know, around art and engineering um, that kind of, you know, start to express what people think about them. You know, engineering, you really expect people to, to make something that's the best and prove it. You know, there's a lot of this... Um, this pressure to say that your way is, you know, the best way it could be, that you're using the resources the most efficiently that you can, that you're making the best software. And it gets really high pressure, and it becomes so much more about the, about the technology than about the, um, you know, about the connections you're forging with people. You know, you want something that's the fastest, but not necessarily the most interesting. You want to build, you know, the best structure, but, you know, when you're making art, it's more important that it's yours. In engineering, a lot of the time, you know, you really want something to be um, kind of immutable. You want it to be kind of contained, read-only. You know, when you're making art, it's, it's all about making something that's, you know, that's labeled, that's, you know, easy to, to, um, easy to share in its entirety. You want to actually go all the way deep, all the way down into the depths of something and be able to communicate about it. And then you can think about this in terms of the culture that it spawns. And again, this isn't necessarily, you know, about sort of capitalism versus, you know, you know, sort of hobbyists. I think you can take both of these cultures and fit them into either sort of the hobbyist or the capitalist um, side of the world. Um, a lot of times we think about this proprietary um, kind of engineering culture as, you know, being in the lead, you know, innovating, and then the open culture is catching up. And you see this a lot with, um, with open source especially. You know, there's this kind of idea that, you know, there's the, there's, you know, for a long time, Windows was, you know, coming out with all of the best new features, and Linux was always catching up. And now, you know, that's not always the case. You see, you know, the proprietary culture has to catch up in some places where the open culture started out innovating, and vice versa. And so it's a cycle. And I think the most important part um, of this is to really think about what's inside that cycle. You know, who is really, who is really holding on to these ideas, and who is benefiting from them. I think when we make a product or when we make a, when we're working on, um, you know, a new thing, whether it's art or engineering, there's this idea that it's something that we've done, you know, we have this knowledge that we've gained from it. And when I, when I do this at a company, you know, I've worked in Silicon Valley for like six years and worked at startups in San Francisco and, 
it really seems like you're doing this thing that's about we, that's about you know, building up the knowledge that we all have. But you've actually kind of created this boundary around that, that's the balls of your company. And if your coworkers don't understand, if your company breaks down, if, you, you know, if that disintegrates, then you lose all of that you've built up. Whereas in open source culture, you know, I guess that could be everyone. Maybe. I mean, that's, that's kind of this idea that we have, that with open culture, um, everyone benefits from it. Um, I don't think that's actually necessarily true right now, because there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of obstacles that people face in terms of perceptions, in terms of access to people, to knowledge, to equipment. Um, so right now, everyone isn't benefiting from open culture, but I think there's that possibility that anyone can benefit from it, and that it's up to us to try to bring that to as many people as possible. And I think even more so than this idea of kind of where does the, you know, where does the culture and where does the knowledge stay is the idea of, you know, who sees us when we put ourselves into our work. And I think this happens in the context of art and in engineering. People just pour their lives into their work. But in this kind of proprietary culture, nobody really sees that except for the company maybe, except for maybe your office mates. And, you know, I think that's really isolating. I think that's a promise that we're breaking, especially to young people, to women who are being told that they should get into engineering. I think we need to be honest about what we expect people to do and where their work is going to go and what kinds of connections that work is capable of creating with people. And if we're telling people to get into um, the fields of technology because it can be creative, we should really, you know, push them into fields that are creative. You know, and not just focus on the technology, but focus on how people apply the technology and what the culture around it is. So, thank you.